Good morning. Welcome to um, the Madrean uh, Watersheds Workshop today. We're, I'm Genevieve Johnson. I'm the coordinator for the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. I know a lot of you have been involved in the work that we've been doing over the past several years and also came to a workshop that we had um, in Tucson last year. Um, so thank you all for, for coming this morning. Some of you have traveled from quite a ways. Some of you are local. This is our first workshop that is specific to this landscape conservation planning and design pilot area that was chosen last year. Um, and so we really want to concentrate on this particular location during this workshop. Um, first, can everybody in the back hear me okay? Perfect. Um, we are going to be in here in this room this morning. We want to thank the University of Arizona and all the staff with the Climate Science Center and the um, Natural Resources Group who helped us secure this facility for our meeting today um, and tomorrow. Um, we have breakout groups this afternoon and tomorrow, and those also will be on the second floor. The bathrooms are right across the hallway here. There's also some bathrooms that are in the cafe. There's a small cafe if you want anything um, in particular. And we will be handing out also um, places that you can walk to for lunch uh, today and tomorrow. We have some snacks and coffee um, over here in the corner. It wasn't placed there on purpose to make everybody look at you. And that's just where we could find an outlet that works. Um, but we'll also have snacks and, and coffee in the breakout rooms. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce our team. Again, I'm the coordinator for the Desert LCC, as most of you know. Where's, is Amy here? Oh, there she is. Um, Amy Robertson was the science coordinator for the Desert LCC. She's taken a new position. And we are very happy today to have um, Matt Graybow, who's the new science coordinator for the Desert LCC. Matt, if you want to stand up just so everybody can look at you. <laughs> Matt's first day <laughs> Matt's first day was Monday. Um, he does not yet have a, an email address, so we haven't sent out anything um, official. But please um, introduce yourselves today if you have any questions or, or comments. Um, go ahead and, and stop him and, and chat. Um, and then as soon as we have all the official inf contact information, we'll send that out to everybody so you guys have that. Will the rest of the Desert LCC staff, um, including our core team for the landscape design, please stand up. Yeah, that means you, Damien. <laughs> uh, Damien Raut is one of the graduate students who's working with us on a grasslands project. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, the, all, of our, all of the folks that are helping today um, work in multiple capacities, of course. Larry Fisher is the professor here at the University of Arizona who's been helping with the students and helping with the landscape design project. Um, very instrumental in helping us do the workshop as well as help guide the research that uh, is going on with the students. Akanksha Sharma is probably outside or upstairs. She's another one of the students working, graduate students working with us. Amanda, you met at the check-in table. And Amanda's been working with the Desert LCC for almost two, almost three years now. Yeah. Um, so I can no longer complain about not having help or staff. Uh, <laughs> and um, she'll be, she, if you are one, on one of our working groups or teams, you've spoken to her quite a bit. Uh, Ashwin Nadu is one of our, is also new. He started officially about two weeks ago. Um, and he will be helping us with one of our working groups looking at physi physiological impacts of climate change, as well as doing communications um, support and science communications for us. So you'll get emails from him coming up. Mo Carell is with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. She's one of our core team members for the Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Team and doing a lot of the analysis for us, so you'll be hearing from her later today. Louise Mistals, the everything <laughs> of the landscape conservation and design planning team. Um, she is doing a lot of the project management, doing a lot of the outreach. Um, you'll also be hearing more from her today on the specifics of um, where we've been in this process so far and where we're going. Tani Robertson is, um, 
facilitator. She's with Southwest Decision Resources, and she and her team, Colleen, who's also upstairs, I guess. <laughs> so you'll meet a few other folks as we come as as you move into different groups, um, and Sergio, who d needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> so I know that's what happens when you walk in late. Uh, so they've been helping us with a lot of the outreach, with the stakeholder identification process. You have seen emails from them as well. They'll be helping to facilitate additional um, specific group dis discussions in each one of our pilot areas. Sergio Avila is now with Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum and is also helping us specifically with outreach um, and work in, with me our Mexican colleagues in our pilot areas. Um, with that, that's, oh, well, yes. <laughs> um, we also have our additional partners who have been instrumental on this. We have Carolyn Enquist and Stephen's not here yet, Stephen Jackson, um, with the Climate Science, Southwest Climate Science Center. Um, and so the they um, are working specifically with the landscape conservation and design pilot areas. They'll be helping us with scenario planning, helping us with look at impacts to climate change from climate change and other stressors on these systems. Um, very key, and again, helping us make sure that we have this facility hosting our science coordinator here, so that we can increase that collaboration and make sure that we have the relevant science, um, landscape level science that's needed to move forward in this process. Um, just as a quick introduction for folks in the room, one of the goals of today is to make sure that you guys all get to know each other, although I think quite a few people already do. If you are involved in the Desert LCC Steering Committee and or a working group, will you please raise your hand? So all the people who have their hands up know just as much about what's going on as the rest of us. If you have any questions, please turn to one of them and, and ask them. Um, if they can't answer your question, then of course one of us can. But one of the goals of the Landscape Conservation Cooperative Partnership is to make sure that we are a partnership and this is being driven by our partners. And so the lessons learned and the information that we are compiling and sharing and the processes that we are developing, we want to make sure that you can get the same answers from everybody who participates with us as you can from existing staff. By a show of hands, were folk, how many folks were at our uh, workshops either in Aguas Calientes or in Tucson last year? Okay. And how many folks are just brand new? Ah, all right. So, yeah, you're not quite brand new. Um, so if uh, we, we are going to kind of start in the middle a little bit um, in the conversations today, so please don't, if you have any questions about history or where we are, ask them. Um, we, we didn't have quite enough time to go through all of the information that we had developed up to this point, um, but we know that there's a lot of new folks. That's kind of one of the points of doing this in a pilot area is to get that local interest, get new information in. And so again, um, we want to be really collaborative, really interested in sharing information, and really open and transparent in where we are and where we're going. So please ask questions at any time. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Tawny. Hello? Oh, such high quality equipment. <laughs> uh, great to uh, see all of you. We've been preparing for this for a while, um, and we're really excited um, and nice to see so many of you that have been involved um, already, as well as all of you who are new to this effort. Um, I just want to go over um, a couple things. One is your packet. Did everybody get it? Raise your hand if you did not get a folder. Oh, good. Our registration table team is super good. Um, also, uh, so inside your packet is, on the right-hand side are going to be materials for today, the agenda, participant list, and some other documents that you'll be drawing on. And the left side are more reference materials. Um, the first one is uh, an overview of this um, Madrean, transboundary Madrean watersheds region that um, Juan Carlos Bravo and a number of partners put together initially to get this um, area selected. This is kind of a, 
a revised version to become like a foundational document as we move forward. And Juan Carlos will talk more about that, but I just wanted to call out that one in particular. Um, we also have a few um, handouts that, we'll, that didn't make it in here that we'll give you maybe at lunchtime. Um, the interpreting, we have, I think, four people. I'm saying this in English, not Spanish, because we're already set up and it's, it's functioning. So the interpreters are in the back. Raise your hands. And the four of you who are Spanish primarily or only speakers, ustedes que hablan solamente el español. Okay. And the interpreting está bien. Okay. So when, when you, this is going to be simultaneous interpreting through the process, and we've aligned their, their groups with their interpreters. So hopefully it'll all go smoothly. But if you have questions or comments during the, at any time, then it's going to become cons what we call consecutive. So you'll s just stand up, don't feel at all like you can, and you can ask your question or make your comment, and then they will uh, interpret for the rest of us back to English. So just to clarify that. Okay, um, you all should have a lunch options handout at your place. You might want to be kind of thinking about it. We only have an hour, and we only included walkable places near here. So you're going to, when we break for lunch, you'll just go and, and then come back and make it back in an hour. So this is a really big decision. <laughs> Where are you going to go? All right. <clears throat> and then um, I think Jen already kind of talked through the housekeeping. There's various bathroom options. There is that, the cafe right down the way. We do have um, our refreshments. There's a, a, some of the plugs don't work, so that's why they're kind of over there, the, the refreshments. We're just trying to keep you on your toes. And um, we will provide water next time. Uh, we apparently forgot to allow for the, <laughs> we were so into the coffee that we <laughs> forgot that some people might not like coffee. Um, but there are drinking fountains and drinks available down at the cafe. And then lastly, um, just to explain what's happening in the morning, I'm going to actually explain more of the workshop itself at the end of the, the pre morning presentation. So we're going to have a, a set of overview presentations by Genevieve. Larry will talk about large landscape conservation to set the broader context. Uh, Juan Carlos will talk about the transboundary Madrid and watersheds region specifically. And then we'll have a brief Q&A opportunity, and then Louise will talk about this process. Um, I'll talk about that as well with her and this workshop. Um, and then Carol and Esther will talk about their pressures and stressors um, kind of project that's, that's informing this effort. Uh, and then we're going to um, lastly do a, uh, just a brief overview of the, the very first thing we're doing is shared vision and goals for this this area. So Genevieve's going to introduce that, and then we'll then we'll take a break, and and I'll explain more in a in a little while. So with that, are there any questions before we get started? Oh yes. So just to explain for presenters, can you? Hi. I'm Mo. Um, so everyone who's presenting, if you come up right before you give your presentation, we'll wire you up with a little lapel mic and this fun um, attachment to put either on your, you know, on your pocket or on the back of your, of your pants. And then you also have a clicker right here and a laser pointer as well. And the laser pointer is the little red line. And it works quite nicely. Um, and if you have any questions, please let us know. Also, during the Q&A sessions, we're going to have some runners with... Um, these microphones. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Someone will come and give you the microphone and we'll turn it on in that way. Everyone can hear your question and we'll also have it recorded. And I think um, Tani mentioned this already, but we are recording this session just for those um, people that couldn't make it today. Um, so just so you all know that's going on. And if you have any questions about that, you can come and um, ask me or Ashwin up here. Just recording these plenary presentations, not, not everything. And pre any uh, presenters, be watching for these little cards because we don't want these presentations to go on and on. Um, as much as you have to share, that's super important. So um, we're going to start with Genevieve when she's set. Okay. 
Um, so I'm just doing a really broad overview of landscape conservation planning and design process. Um, this is just sort of the background info, and then we'll be moving into more specifics, specifically for our pilot areas and the desert LCC. Um, Louise and Tani will be bringing that up. Um, so, maybe. So first, um, just wanted to let everybody know, remind everybody that the LCC network is um, pretty large. Um, we are one of 22 LCCs. Um, the desert, of course, is the orange one that's down here, but it spans the Pacific Islands up through the Arctic, Canada, the US, Mexico, and then over to the Caribbean. These um, polygons were really drawn based on ecoregional boundaries for the most part, and um, they, so they cross a lot of t traditional jurisdictional boundaries. So what is landscape conservation planning and design? So we're really looking at it from um, different perspectives, looking at people, process, products, and purpose. Um, the people, we want to be really inclusive. We want to make sure that we're looking at landscape level stakeholders, multi jurisdictions, multi sectors. This is pretty much the typical language that you hear in any type of planning process. Um, but what we're doing is starting from that as a foundation. Um, instead of just getting input, we're trying to make sure that all of you help drive the process and products as well. The process is interdisciplinary, so we're looking at um, convening different stakeholders, convening different folks, assess, using assessments to look at different factors associated with large landscapes. Um, these, we call these pilot areas because we're really trying to learn from it to see if it's a, proto see if it's a prototype that will work to have um, more significant outcomes at the end. And then using the information that we have to do strategic, tr strategic actions. The products that we're looking for are spatially explicit maps, models, spatially explicit data, so not just text, but something visual that everybody can use. Um, data, of course, and then strategies and agreements so that we want this to be collaborative, we want most people to be able to um, participate along the way, and at the end have something that you can take out of it that you could use in your typical day-to-day -day job. The purpose really is integration, so that we're not managing for a single species or a single resource, but for multiple purposes. Um, looking at coordinated um, implementation, collective impact, and again, this sort of co-governance, this co-development with all of the stakeholders in the room. So you guys have seen these wheels probably a million times. It's uh, this idea of convening folks, assessing the landscape co uh, conditions, doing a design um, spatially, and then strategy design, which is really that agreement on what actions we should take and who can do what where, and then implementing that, monitoring it, and revising it as needed. So it's sort of the typical adaptation wheel, just put into the context of landscape conservation design. But why are we doing this? I mean, that's really the big question, right? Uh, landscape conservation cooperatives, as well as most of the folks in this room, realize that uh, we're facing big challenges today. Um, we're trying to do a lot of things with less resources and respond to big challenges like climate change, like widespread invasive species, like uh, drought, like habitat fragmentation. So we can't really do this anymore in silos. We can't do this just on the land that we all manage individually because these issues cross those jurisdictions, species cross those jurisdictions the resources that we care about cross these jurisdictions, and the things that we want out of these resources and these landscapes cross these jurisdictions. And so one of the goals behind this type of process is to make sure that we are collectively agreeing on what we care about most, trying to agree on how we're going to analyze that information and what's impacting the things that we care about most, and then collectively agree on strategies that would help us move towards that common goal. So one of the big things with that purpose is that we're looking at things like biodiversity, ecosystem services, resilience of these landscapes, and sustainability. Again, terms that you've heard before that lots of other planning processes have used, but again, focused on interdisciplinary, multi-sector, and across these big jurisdictions. We'll be talking about these topics a lot today in your breakout groups, so we just want to introduce them, make sure that we're thinking on these kind of scales. 
right now we're sort of in this convening partners section where we're looking, we've done this, we've brought people together, we asked people to um, nominate pilot areas and this one in particular was selected. We do currently have conservation um, priorities for springs, streams, and grasslands. Um, and for springs and streams, that includes the aquatic and riparian resources. We'll be talking about those more in the breakout groups. And what we're getting to in this particular area um, over the next couple of months is really looking at what are indicators for those systems. Also, we still need specifically for the Madrean pilot area, um, specific conservation goals for other resources that are a priority in this location. We're also gonna start working on um, assessing current and future conditions. So collecting that existing information, you probably got emails from Mo asking for this type of information and she'll go through some of the information that we've collected so far. This is also where BLM's rapid eco-regional assessments comes in. They've done a lot of work here and we can use that and build on it. Identifying stressors to these systems, conducting vulnerability assessments, um, Carol Lynn and will help talk, we'll talk about uh, developing future scenarios tomorrow and throughout this identifying missing information. Through that, the next step is really to go back to our conservation goals and objectives and see if these are feasible and something we can really achieve. If we can't and we need to change it, then we'll change them at that point. But identifying stressors is also something that the Desert LCC has been working on for quite a while and you'll hear more about that from um, Carol and Esther later today as well. Next will be design. This is, again, what Mo will be working on in the next year. Um, we want to today really look and discuss things like connectivity, biodiversity, human well-being, and ecosystem services because this will inform the type of analysis that we do. When we get to strategy design, um, we're going to be looking at identifying management strategies. So we want to note from the conversations today what you guys are already doing, what works, what doesn't, and we want to use that information so that we can inform this particular step when we get to it as well. Um, we do need to get to the point where we are agreeing on who does what, where, when, and how, and then make sure again that we're closing that loop by sharing that information. And then lastly, we will need to of course implement, monitor, and then revise the strategy. And that's why we really want to build this learning culture. So as we talk, we learn from each other, we decide if something is or isn't working, and then we go back and change either our strategy, the information that we have, or potentially our conservation goals and objectives. Lastly, the one thing I want to show you is um, lots of folks have been involved in these large planning processes. The question we always get is why is this different? This is a paper that will be coming out hopefully this year, um, an excerpt from the paper, um, looking at traditional planning, um, and kind of what is going on within traditional planning and characteristics for landscape conservation design. Um, often in traditional planning, it's a single institution that's driving it. There's a lot of internal coordination and um, partners are asked to give input, but they're not really driving the process. Um, and because of that, it's, you're really trying to meet individual agent or institutional goals and objectives. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the point. Um, in, Agencies have to do that. Um, but in this particular case, because nothing that we are doing is, um, everything that we're doing is, is voluntary, it's collaborative, there's not a policy in place that says a particular individual or agency or organization must implement anything that we're doing. We're able to really focus on it being cross-jurisdictional, multi-sector, making sure that the process and products are driven by the collective, driven by the folks in, who are in the room because they want something different and they want a different outcome and agree to implement those things at the end. So we're focused on social learning um, beyond institutional boundaries, being collaborative as opposed to um, just having input at specific sections. All right, and that's all I have. Ringing introduction. Can you hear me? Um, thank you. Um, I have the unenviable task of trying to provide the 50,000 foot perspective um, after that very, very uh, nuts and bolts and, and detailed uh, presentation. I'm going to draw us back out to the national perspective and try to give people a sense of uh, what is happening um, 
both nationally and regionally in terms of large landscape conservation. And um, if it seems a bit pedestrian, it is designed to be, um, I will try to whiz by a lot of it because most of it is familiar to you and many of the cases that I'll talk about are familiar to you, so I, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, I think we're all aware of the big challenges that we're facing over the, uh, uh, over the course of the last two decades. Um, big uh, forest health issues and the catastrophic wildfires we've seen in the last 10 years of wildfires. We have had t six uh, record years in terms of area covered. Huge watershed uh, management issues, um, invasive species, uh, drought, uh, disease and pest problems, um, the growth of the cities, particularly in the West. We're seeing more than 90% um, of the citizens in the West are moving into the cities and um, that urban sprawl and the growing sense of the urban footprint and how that uh, stretches with the, uh, with the rural uh, landscape is becoming increasingly important. And then that leads to loss of critical habitat and impacts on uh, ecosystem services, biodiversity, and of course all that's taking place in the context of, of climate change. Um, the, the general trend uh, in the last uh, decade for sure, and we're seeing, uh, you know, in terms of legislation and programs and institutions that are showing up, working on large landscape uh, conservation, um, starts with this sense of the limits of governance and the importance of working across jurisdictions. Um, here, working across the, the boundary, um, uh, but even in, uh, in, our, in our forests, you know, most of the forests in, the, in Region 3 are either separated, like the, uh, the Coronado, into districts with large landscapes in between, or they're large contiguous forests, like the four forests uh, in, in the northern part of the state, where they're, in both uh, situations we have to see a larger landscape view. And in the re most recent planning rule, that was an emphasis, the all-lands, all-hands approach was uh, a big part of the whole discussion about the promulgation of the 2015 pr planning rule in the Forest Service. We also recognize the weakness of the parks and uh, protected areas model, both here and internationally. We're seeing that just drawing a line on a map to protect it for species or particular habitats doesn't get the job done, and we have a lot of good examples of that that I'll cover as, as I go through this today. And then, you know, we just have all these new tools and understanding of ecosystem science. We, we, we now have a better grasp of what ecosystem function, composition, structure uh, is all about. We understand the role of ecosystem services much better starting to quantify and monetize that in some cases. And then we have all these great new analytical tools, uh, particularly mapping tools that help us do the analysis that it takes at these, at these large scales. Now the core elements, uh, if you look at the literature and um, you know, that's emerging in this field, um, the large landscape approach involves uh, actions distributed across a range of land uses, a range of landscapes and government arrangements. Uh, it works uh, in a nested way. This goes back to Eleanor Ostrom's sense of the commons, that, that nested enterprises over these landscapes is a critical part of it. We have, to, we have to think about scale, and we have to position our activities at different scales with different objectives. We have to think about both the connections and the core ele elements of the ecosystems, um, and we have to begin to think and act across boundaries. And finally, it's not just about large, because there's no real definition of what large is about. The National Network of, of the National Practitioners Network for Large Landscape Conservation talks about this T-shirt idea of large landscapes that they're small, medium, large, extra large, XXL. That it, it's really not about size; it's about complexity, and it's about all of the elements that go into you know these diverse array of components and stakeholders. So, uh, sorry. So uh, just a quick mention of some of the national programs that we're seeing. Uh, again, all of these have merged in pretty much the last. A uh, decade or so, the, the U.S. Forest Service has uh, 23 sites across the country, the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, um, and the Department of Interior has uh, both the LCCs, the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives, as well as the Climate Science Centers, and uh, uh, Genevieve mentioned the, the Rapid Eco Ecoregional Assessments by the BLM. Uh, I mentioned the Practitioners Network. Uh, that's a recent development. That's a, 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 a interdisciplinary multi-stakeholder group of people that are working for large landscapes and highlighting, showcasing some of the great examples around the country. We have uh, nonprofits like the Center for Large Landscape Conservation. We have an urban alliance of, um, of large landscape uh, programs 
uh, you can't see the map here, but that's you know Chicago, Baltimore, Los Angeles, um, Houston. A number of big cities are starting to look at the landscape beyond their urban footprint and talk about the urban-rural connection, and they form this Metropolitan Green Space Alliance that's doing a lot of the advocacy for this work and a lot of the sharing that's so important to it. And then the rest Western Governors Association has been a, a fulcrum for a lot of great activity in terms of large landscape conservation. I'll just mention their, their Corridors Initiative. If you haven't seen it, it's a really great document and a great set of analysis of, of these issues. Um, lots of national examples. Uh, again, you can go to the Great Lakes, uh, Chicago Wilderness, Yellowstone to Yukon, you know, again, from small to XXL, you know. Uh, Crown of the Continent is mentioned a lot. A lot of literature emerging about these cases. Great opportunity for learning. And I'll just put in a shameless plug here for our uh, plans to do a webinar series, which will be a series of case studies about these national examples, which we'll be making available to all of you. We should be starting that with Ashwin Naidu and other people's help in the, uh, in the, in the near future. So... Now, in the local sense, uh, we also have a lot um, that even predates the, the, the kind of the paradigm shift. And I'll just talk about the, some of these very briefly. Skyline Alliance, Firescape, this North Distant Conservation Plan, um, San Pedro, uh, La Cienegas, Leslie Canyon. Each of these offers very different kind of perspectives that give us insight into what's going on. But of course, I guess the context that we have to be aware of is the growth uh, in this state that's going to occur in the next 50 years and to be mindful of how this uh, you know, creates enormous challenges uh, in addition to the ones that I've been mentioning so far. Um, as one example of the ana analysis starting to show the impact of, the, of this urban sprawl, this is Ashwin Naidu's work with his colleagues looking at mountain lion populations and you know, they've done analysis of, of, of these 500 plus samples and look at the distribution across the state. And as you look at this, you start to see the pattern emerge, which is most exemplified here, that it's the roads, primarily the major highways, that start separating our, our, our wildlife and our landscapes from each other. Uh, and again, it's this kind of broad scale analysis that reminds us how important it is to be thinking at these, at these larger scales. Now, the Skyline Alliance has done uh, quite a bit of mapping and doing conservation priorities across the, the region, the region that they define as the Sky Islands. Um, it's fairly coterminous with the transboundary Madrean watershed, so that it f provides a good uh, foundation for the work that we're going to be talking about. And they've emphasized the core areas, wildlife linkages, restoration priorities. Um, Louise uh, Mistal uh, uh, did this as part of her master's thesis here at the University of Arizona and uh, used expert opinion and a lot of GIS analysis to determine the areas of highest uh, priority conservation. Thank you, Louise. Great work. Firescape is another uh, uh, regional example uh, where uh, the U.S. Forest Service, U of A scientists, and, and other partners have worked together to look at fire and managing fire across these large landscapes to achieve ecologically sound, large-scale, multi-party, and safe treatments that contribute to safe, sustainable, resilient ecosystems. And they've done this in four areas, and they've done NEPA-ready uh, analysis on, I think, three out of the four have already been approved. These are NEPA analysis that are being done at, at scale that uh, we're starting to see a, a greater move toward. If we can get that NEPA analysis at this broader scale, then we can have the flexibility to do that, the treatments on the ground um, within specific project areas that speed things up. I think the Forefry has been wrestling with the same issues in northern, northern Arizona. And then the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan is another one that uh, we've seen uh, develop in the region. Uh, Brian Powell is here, so he can certainly talk. Uh, it's a great resource on uh, what's happened here, looking at um, the, uh, the attempt to really create a, a broad uh, scale planning effort for the county. Um, it was integrated to the county comprehensive land use plan and uh, has included the, the conservation land system. It, you know, again, we'll, we see time and again that when we have these single issue uh, impetus toward large landscape conservation, what, hap what ends up happening when people get together and they start talking about those landscapes, so we see all of these other unplanned, unintended perhaps, opportunities that emerge. And in the case of the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan, we saw response to invasive species, designation of new federal lands, transportation uh, design and construction practices, flood plain ordinance, water resources policy, a bunch of things that came out of this 
more comprehensive view of, now we're talking about a landscape, what else do we, do we need to do in that landscape? And then, of course, we had the bond issue that was approved in 2004, 160, almost $165 million for acquisition of open space. And now we have the, the uh, son of uh, Snow Desert Conservation Plan, the multi-species conservation plan that I guess was just approved by Fish and Wildlife. Right? This actually 10 permit was just approved. Um, another great example in the region, and Bill Radke is here, and this is the analysis that uh, uh, Damien Rao is starting to do is his master's thesis, looking at how um, conservation easements have been used to expand the footprint of con conservation. The Leslie Canyon National Wildlife Refuge is only 2,700 acres, but with the, with the pink area here, these are two conservation easements that total more than 30,000 acres that protected the bulk of the upper watershed for that small little uh, federal uh, protected area. Um, it's a great example. Bill's in the, and Jan and uh, here as well, so they're great resources on this case. And then uh, San Pedro is another cautionary tale in the region. If we look at um, the San Pedro, the, the upper San Pedro, uh, this is the BLM um, site here. Thank you. Um, you know, BLM in 1998 set aside this ribbon of riparian area, the Sprinka, the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area, um, not thinking ahead that ultimately it's the watershed that was going to be the, the problem. And in the recent uh, resource management planning process, all of the other issues that came out, you know, managing that riparian area versus managing the watershed as a whole, all of the other ecosystem services, biodiversity, water supply development, farming and ranching, all of those multi-jurisdictional multi, multi issues came to the fore in terms of how do we manage this, this uh, protected area in the context of a larger landscape. And that's something that we, we just have to keep, keep focused on. Uh, Los Angeles is facing the same problem. It's a beautiful area in uh, southeast of here. Uh, has a very innovative adaptive management program. But again, as somebody who uh, you know, sits on the San Diego Watershed Partnership Board, works a lot with the BLM, and this, if you look at this map, you see that this little area, then this is the acquisition boundary. This is the, uh, the yellow is actually the, the land that is currently protected, but surrounded by a sea of state lands and all of these corridors and all of the, the broader landscape conservation questions um, challenge us to think uh, more broadly about how we position that protected landscape, the, the La Cienegas National Conservation Area in that, in that setting. So quickly, uh, some key lessons, and, uh, and I'll close, that, close up. Um, in all of these cases, we see that the start is developing a common vision. The Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program started by incentivizing people to say, we will support you if you develop a vision, because they realized that with that vision in place, that common vision of people working together and seeing that landscape and understanding its multiple benefits is at the core of success. There is no set scale. We often have to think of, 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 of nested uh, initiatives, and in this case, the Transboundary Madrean, we see the, spring, the uh, San Pedro as one of many smaller landscapes positioned in this larger, very large landscape. Uh, we have to recognize that meetings like this are part of that startup time. It takes time to get people together, to forge that common vision, to develop plans, to develop objectives, to develop measurements, and to see them through. But those are important investments. Um, Again, we see in many cases where a focus on a, a specific issue. In the crown of the continent, it was grizzly bears. In the eastern Mojave, it was desert tortoise. But both of those efforts have become, like the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, a multi-species, a multi-faceted conservation effort. Collaboration, obvious uh, that we can't get there if we don't work together. We, we, we have different jurisdictions, we have different skills and resources and capacities, and, and, and that's the thing that's going to uh, sustain us over time. We have to focus on monitoring. Uh, we have to have clear metrics uh, to, to make sure that we know we're making progress, that there's transparency, that the, inve that the investment is worth it. And then, you know, what, again, with this, um, with all the work that we're seeing with the Practitioners Network, with the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program with the LCCs, this peer learning is so important because it's a new, this is a new enterprise and we're, we're just getting kind of started. And then finally, I just wanted to say um, how these are, are uh, 
illustrated in the recent National Academy of Science review of the LCCs, which really said that, um, that the metrics of performance were, were front and center and that the, the, uh, each of the LCCs, the 22 different LCCs, has to figure out what those metrics are in context of the national uh, LCC network. And that evaluation uh, was important to capture the contributions of all the partners, that the collaboration coordination with other landscape efforts, particularly the joint ventures, state agencies, and the climate science centers is important. I think we see that today with the presence of all those folks here. And then um, guidance on, on, on landscape conservation design, which is what this meeting is about. Now, those are the lessons that I've heard from other people that I've read in the literature. Here's what I would like to say as our challenge for today. We do need to develop a common vision. We need to commit to clear, measurable objectives. We need to build a, an effective and efficient collaborative structure. We can't meet endlessly without something effective and productive happening in each meeting. We're going to have to, as, as Matt Damon said in The Martian, we're going to have to science the spit out of this thing. And then we're going to have to monitor, learn, and adapt. Sorry for going over. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. And next up, we have Juan Carlos from the Wildlands Network to talk about our Transfounder Madrian <laughs> watershed region. <laughs> thank you. So yes, this is our Transboundary Madrian watersheds. Our, can I have the pointer please? Thank you. <laughs> Our shared watersheds are a land of fire and a land of ice. They are a land of flood and a land of drought. They are a land of great richness and they're also a land of great poverty. They are a land where islands come out of the sky and grasslands extend beyond the horizon. They are home to some of North America's most iconic wildlife. They are also victims of some of mankind's ugliest scars on Earth. You can see they are a land of contrasts. And so we gather again, because for some of us it's like, the nth meeting, to try and pull together this common vision that Larry was talking about. What can this common vision be? We must all join around it in some way. We must leave aside our personal ideologies. We must leave aside our pride in our hat or our job description or our nationality and our flag. We must really all come together to try and find this common vision, yes, based on science. It's not a dream, it's not an ideal. It's based on very tangible things. Monitoring things, measuring them systematically, and analyzing them thoroughly. We must understand the forces that make this land. We must understand where fires are gonna have the biggest impacts in the future, right? We must also understand the threats, you know. It's not just fragmentation. This is the cleanup of the mining spill in the Sonora River. We're facing many of these different threats that will not only affect one place, will affect the whole region. And we must also come here and present what our values are for the region. They're not always going to be the same, and that's okay. The thing is, we must honor this diversity that the region has because of its past, because of its geography. And then, together with those things, that's when we get to build this common vision. If we can get this out of this meeting, I'm happy with that, you know? The rest will come l later. We've got time to monitor, to agree, to do a bunch of things, but we have to start somewhere. Not only do we need to understand where these fires have the biggest impact, 
We must understand what jaguars need to cross the border. We must understand how much water is available for people and wildlife. We must figure out what the heck's going on with monarchs during the fall, right? <laughs> we must figure out what roads are breaking, what was meant to be a single thing. And we must figure out where the last refugia of our smallest and most humble brethren are. We must understand what prairie dog colonies need to be resilient, but also what bisons need to return in thousands, right? The small and the large, a land of contrasts. This is where we are. This is what we need to put together somehow. And once we figure all this out, once we unravel nature, we have this question, what do we manage and what do we leave unmanaged? Because it is very tempting to say we have the brightest minds in the region that are going to science the shit out of this and they're going to put together everything and now we know what to do with the landscape. Yes, but the landscape has been doing it a lot better than we have for millions and millions of years. And we must humbly accept that some things we will leave unmanaged. Our tools to manage these things, we all know them. Genevieve's talked about them. There's going to be very humble things, such as our GIS models and our reports and our plans and our agreements. All those things are useful, as mundane as they may be in comparison to the beauty and grandeur of this region. We still need all of those things to come out of this team as a collective representation of the shared vision. But we must also think about how do we make an impact. A lot of those documents will end up in drawers and people will not read them. Not all the people that we want, at least. So we need to figure out a way to transform these documents into outreach pieces, into entertainment pieces that can reach everyone that's involved in the region. We must inspire ranchers, government, personnel, engineers, foresters. We must have them all know the basics of this collective vision. We know it's so complex that none of us can grasp the whole thing. But at least they should understand that it's based on diversity, it's based on contrast, it's based on keeping things connected. Those basic things should become the culture of this region, not of this group. And that's what we need to think about. How are we going to take that next step? So for the next couple of days, we're going to ask of you. For all of you in the room who are scientists, share your knowledge with no interest. There might be things that you want to publish later on, and we'll honor those, but do generously share your knowledge. To land managers, we ask you, look beyond your fences, and then look beyond your neighbor's fences, and look beyond your borders, and think what needs to happen so that what I try to keep will hold many generations down. It won't happen in your piece of land, no matter how pristine. It won't happen if your neighbor is a good neighbor. It will happen if your whole community in both sides of the border in all of our four states are working together. And that's what we're here to do. Conservation groups, we ask of you these days, collaborate. Some of you are struggling and competing for funds, for attention, for whatever. Not today, not tomorrow. We're here to collaborate. This is what we're here to do. So, <laughs> while you're here, bring this mindset. Oh, and I'm forgetting agency representatives. <laughs> we ask of you these two couple of days to honor only the mandate that you have to steward this land for the benefit of future generations. That's what you're here to do. Regardless of what any other pressure is on you, this is what you're here to do these couple of days. So with that in mind, I hope you can all have 
a very productive and very fun meeting. Thank you. Okay, that was what a great talk and talks. Uh, interpreters, I know Juan Carlos talked slower, probably um, more at the rate you would like. How about the rest? Can you give for them? Was it too fast or okay? Okay, a little too fast. I'll try to slow down. Okay. Um, any questions for Juan Carlos, Larry, or Genevieve about the opening, the introductory talks? Questions or comments? We're going to have lots of opportunity to talk. This isn't your only moment. Okay. All right, let's move on to Louise to talk about the overall process and, and this workshop. Yes, I've got this. All right, so that's a tough act to follow. I'm feeling a bit choked up. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for the inspiration. I think it's really important. Um, thank you. <laughs> Just thinking, how do we? So how did we get here? <laughs> Um, this, this cartoon shows these folks entering the middle and they're holding a map to nowhere <laughs> and saying, oh, this is just going from bad to worse. This is not where we are and this is not how we got there. We know where we are. We're here in the Transboundary Madrean region. We've just heard some beautiful um, thoughts on what this region means to all of us and um, we've gotten here through a lot of work that a lot of you in this room have been doing for many years, for decades, and most recently with the conservation design planning process in the last couple of years. So I'll just walk you through quickly kind of where we've been as a quick reminder. So last year uh, we had these introductory workshops. Lots of information came out of those and I'm going to share some of that back with you. Uh, Tani will talk more tomorrow about our stakeholder assessment work, so understanding what all of you are doing in the region and how that fits into this bigger picture that we're creating. Uh, we recruited tw 12 pilot area nominations. This was one of the selected ones. Um, we're really happy to be working in this area. There's a lot going on here that Larry and Genevieve and Juan Carlos all talked about, about why this is such a great place to do this collaborative work and learn from it. And then earlier this year, many of you joined. Uh, we had a great turnout from this group, uh, the kickoff webinar for this pilot area, just to get a, a better sense of where we're going in this process and, and kind of get on the same page. And here we are today at the pilot area workshop. And one of the ways that we got here was really, as I said before, all of your work. So many of you in the region have already, as, as Larry provided many examples, been working across boundaries, been trying to think bigger outside of a particular piece of land that you might own or be managing. Uh, there's lots of complex issues in this region that we've been tackling for many years. And lots of innovative approaches. Um, I see friends here from the Sky Island Restoration Cooperative is a great example uh, that wasn't mentioned yet of trying to think about entire watersheds and how we work together across multiple jurisdictions. And one of the key things Genevieve mentioned is that rivers, uh, springs, springs plus mystery, <laughs> springs plus riparian resources and aquatic resources, and grasslands and shrublands emerged as really important resources for the entire Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. So we're looking at these resources in all of the pilot areas, but they definitely emerged as really important resources out of this um, region through the pilot area nominations and the work that was done at the Tucson workshops. So one of the things uh, we've been doing in the last few months around the stakeholder assessment piece is meeting with folks who are already working in the region to get a sense of what, what is useful to get out of this process, uh, what kind of things would you like to see happen, and we are kind of calling this our, um, what did we call it, our reality check group, our reality check group, um, just to make sure we're, we're moving forward in a way that's useful and can be applied on the ground. And some of the key pieces here are that implementation on the ground, oops, that implementation on the ground piece, which we're going to talk about quite a bit today. Uh, thinking about how we can assess our current management actions. How do we know if what we're already doing is the right thing to do and having the effect we want? 
And how do we monitor our success with this process? I think the shared learning opportunities is really important. We've heard a lot about that already this morning. And prioritization, of course, of where to be working. So some of the emerging themes from the Madrean uh, pilot uh, geographic group work that was done at the Tucson workshop last year included these themes that Genevieve has mentioned that are across all LCCs. So biodiversity, connectivity, particularly across an international boundary in this region, importance of water for humans and wildlife and ecosystems, the link between human communities, uh, our way of life here and nature. I mean, that really, that really emerged out of our discussions in the uh, Madrean group last, last year. And then again, this collaborative work across entire watersheds. So what do we value in this region? We talked a lot about this in the Tucson workshop. Um, the biological diversity has been mentioned. Um, thinking about riparian ecosystems as very valuable ecosystems in and of themselves, but also as corridors. There's lots of rare species here and a diversity of communities, biological communities, and um, this notion of ecological refugia, which is gonna be really important for us to think about in the context of climate change came up strongly. And of course, our endemic grassland birds. So what else do we value about the Madrean? We value our rich cultural diversity. We value water for people so that people are interacting with the landscape through water resources. Um, Juan Carlos put a nice frame around this, but um, it really emerged that people value working across boundaries here and across the international boundary in this binational racial piece. And what are the strategies, interventions, and actions that we need to implement in those places? So typically, this spatial and strategic planning, we do the spatial, and then we have a nice map, and we move to our strategic planning and say, okay, who's gonna do what where? Well, that's not really the most functional way to do this because, um, well, here, I'll say this. So this is our LCPD path. We're trying to walk both of these paths at the same time which might be why it feels a little bit like, where are we going with this? But it's really important that we integrate these pieces because our priority locations for action really depend on what conservation actions we're considering and what tools we have in our toolbox to do this work. So we're really focusing in this process on, on integrating these two things, and you'll see that through developing some vision and goals today and doing some actual thinking tomorrow about what can we be doing in the next year together on the ground. This is uh, hopefully gonna lead us to much better outcomes, but it's also a tougher road to hoe. So <laughs> stick with us and I think we're gonna get there. And part of, part of this thinking about uh, implementing and or, um, integrating strategy and um, spatial planning is just thinking about taking this one step at a time. So this is a quote from Connie Millar. Some of you may know her. She's done a lot of work with the Forest Service on responding to climate change. And she says that we really need to have a portfolio of approaches that include short-term strategies and longer-term strategies that can enhance resilience to climate change. So we're gonna be starting to think about that a lot tomorrow, some short-term strategies that fit in a longer-term uh, construct. So I'll just say a word about, about climate change adaptation and intentionality. So how do we know if what we're doing is, is a climate change adaptation project? Would this pro we, we need to ask ourselves, would this project be done regardless of climate change or is it different? And the ways it can be different are the what we're doing, the where we're doing it, the why we're doing it, the urgency or priority of what we're, what we're doing first or how much of something we're doing. And I think this works too for thinking about intentionality of collaborative planning. So here's some food for thought for tomorrow. Um, these are some of the options we can be thinking about for conservation strategies and adaptation. Accepting and allowing change, resisting change or guiding change. Okay. So these guys are in a boat rowing. <laughs> and uh, the captain says, I've got it too, Omar, a strange feeling like we've been going in circles. <laughs> so 
If you take a look at this, these are some pretty big meaty guys and these are some pretty skinny guys and I think these folks are really probably rowing in a circle because they haven't got their plan mapped out right here. So that is not what we're doing. What we are doing <laughs> is landscape conservation design and we're gonna get the right rowers in the right place and send that boat forward into the future. And with that, I'll let Tani tell you the, the logistics of how we're gonna do that. Okay. So, um, all right, just to reiterate, uh, let's see, which is the, uh, there we go. Okay, so as, as Louise and Genevieve mentioned, we've, there's been a lot of work both at the, with the Desert LCC and what all of you are, are doing and all the place-based collaboratives and just so much great stuff going on. That's all the precursors that we want to build, that we're building on. We have a, a co coordination um, here. There's been some webinars, some focus groups, uh, our survey, all of that in, in a lot of data gathering, data discovery. This is all the stuff that's gone on before today. This is our workshop and there is a bunch of stuff afterwards. We're envisioning in about a year like a milestone event that we would all get back together. But there's a lot to happen between. So um, one thing we want to come out of here is some action teams, topical groups that are going to work in the Madrean on more specific things that you all are interested in. Um, we also have some uh, work that will happen around scenario planning. And Carolyn is going to talk about that later tomorrow. Um, what you all come up with today is going to inform what kind of work they do on developing scenarios, but that'll be a really useful tool uh, for us down the road. Um, and eventually we come out with this design, but it's not something that sits on a shelf. It's something that is an ongoing living guide. And if our biggest key to success is if all of you who make decisions and are man especially land managers, that you're integrating these strategies because they make sense for the whole larger landscape and you're putting money to them and you're implementing them and, you know, change is happening. So, um, in terms of this workshop, and we do have to say that there's, it's really complicated. Like Larry said, it's, these are large landscapes. It's not about exactly the scale, but it's because they're complex. And we do have a huge geography here. So we are trying to wrap, you know, have some sub areas. But so what we're gonna do in the workshop is this morning, we're going to work on Madrian shared vision and goals. And as Louise already mentioned, we have a starting point of goals that you all are already um, have emerged through, through all the work so far, biodiversity, connectivity, and social ecological services. But there's probably, maybe there's a few more that, that are in the category of overarching goals. And then underneath there are fundamental objectives or kind of really uh, sub goals, core values, those kinds of things that help set the, the shared, where are we going? Then we go to lunch. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, and then we, in the afternoon, we're working on, so these are the resources. What's important to you all within the Madrian landscape? We already know grassland stream springs as, as Louise mentioned, but there's others. And last year at this workshop, you all, the people that were here in the Madrian breakout group generated a, a big list. And that's what we sent out in that pre-workshop survey. So we could get a sense of some level of priority among those resources. So we're gonna spend some time trying to um, uh, make uh, headway on this part. Um, and then we've got stressors up here acting on these things. And as Carol and Esther are going to talk a little bit this morning about that, but then we're going to do just a very short activity to, to think about those stressors um, in the Madrean context. Uh, and then we go to happy hour. <laughs> Across the street, <laughs> across the street, due south, just uh, there's a, a a bar called Brew of A, very clever, and so that's our plan. So hope, we're really hoping that many of you will join into that. Uh, networking, as we all value, is is really important. 
Okay, and then um, tomorrow morning, we're going to start out with some tools uh, that are uh, the Conservation Planning Atlas, the website. Um, I don't have the list in front of me. You, it's in your agenda. Uh, but these are tools that we want you to be aware of. Uh, we're also going to, Colleen will actually be sharing the partner assessment results to date. So, um, and then we're going to have a, a current adaptation strategies panel. So the next thing on here is this, all the, this and this, this is a call out. Hopefully you noticed that. We were trying to figure out how to make that seem clear that each of these resources has this happening. Um, but all this feeds into development of strategies. And so, and as Louise said, shorter term and longer term. Shorter term slash easier, less complex. Longer term, more complex. You know, just general categories. Uh, but we're going to first hear about from a panel of people who are already implementing adaptation strategies in the region. And uh, because we want to acknowledge that and build on that. Um, okay, then lunch, and then we're going to do more work on the shorter term strategies and prioritizing some of those and looking at next steps uh, because those we want to kind of churn out of this workshop that there's action happening and, and then we could learn from that and, and bring it back. But concurrent with that would be um, longer term strategies that we're going to be working on that take a little bit more thinking and work. Uh, and that's also where scenario planning is going to really help inform that. And this is not the be all end all end, but we're just trying to share what's happening at this workshop. Um, and then the elephant in the room. <laughs> but maybe not this room, but there are rooms that have this elephant. <laughs> But we just wanted to acknowledge that that's the other kind of piece of this picture and why we're doing all of this. Um, so we're going to, because of that, near the end of tomorrow, Carolyn will do a really uh, short intro on scenario planning and we'll have some discussion about that. <clears throat> uh, and then we'll wrap up with next steps and uh, kind of that collaborative structure moving forward and how you all want to be involved. And if this is a lot of this is about aligning partners and what you're each doing and taking leadership roles and trying to you know um, have collaborative action come out of this for for greater ultimate impact it's not just about the desert LCC and what they're gonna do or what we're gonna do it's about really uh, everybody and their work following this so um, any questions or comments Yes, Tricia? Okay. Oh, here comes a microphone. Hi, I'm Tricia Teradat. I um, live and work in the Upper San Pedro area. I'll, I'll, I'll try to articulate it. Um, there are a lot of federal agencies that I see are here at the table. Um, I see a scarcity of state, at least state of Arizona and um, county except for Pima County and so um, and how do we work on a vision without their presence do we assume that we'll be able to bring them on board later and do our vision and planning um, in a in a dream state or do we um, figure, try to figure how that is going to be an issue and how we might deal with it? Hopefully. That's, that's a really good point, Tricia. And I, I think we're viewing that we're not get, reaching consensus at this workshop. This is generating all kinds of good um, uh, substance. And we're going to have a synthesis team afterwards really try to work with it because we can't do all of that here. But part of that's going to be reaching out to the other counties, the other land managers. The Forest Service isn't here. They, they were signed up, but then they ended up having to pull out at the last minute. There's definite gaps in participants here. So um, that, but there's a whole bunch of follow up that's going to have to happen for the reasons that you say. Uh, anything else? Other questions or comments? 
Okay. So I think what we're going to what we're going to do next is Carol and Esther are going to talk about the pressures and stressors, and then we'll take our break, and then we'll come back for the um, to continue. Okay. Um, is it turned on? Yes. Can you hear? Good. Um, I was glad to see Tawny's slide that showed the progression of the this whole landscape conservation planning and design process, and it showed that piece kind of early on that said um, there's stuff that's happened, <laughs> that, the, that the LCC has been working on, that precedes all of this, and that's kind of where um, what Esther and I are going to talk about falls into that category. So um, we are uh, a part of the, uh, oops, that changed. <laughs> We're part of the science working group, and we are uh, team leaders for uh, the team talking about stressors and also monitoring. So I was really glad to see um, Larry putting that in there front and center, um, that the monitoring and the learning process is, is also very important. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of what we've been doing, our, our raison d'etre. So we, um, we had some very specific questions that we, our team is trying to answer, and that is um, what, let me show you, what species and ecological processes are sensitive climate change and other large scale stressors that we can effectively monitor helping managers? <laughs> and the last part of it is the monitoring design to detect these changes. So that's our, our marching orders. And we've stuck really closely to this, um, and it's been a very helpful uh, question for us to, to um, march forward on. Oops, did I do two? I did do two. OK, so um, after some uh, initial struggling and trying different ways of thinking about um, getting to the answer those questions, um, we came up upon uh, this stepwise approach. Um, so we wanted to uh, identify the stressors and pressures and use that as our link into how we were going to um, monitor those effects. Um, we then, um, oh, I want to say that we use the Selaski et al. Um, um, threats on nomenclature. Um, and this will be available in your breakout groups. I, we have a, a bunch of copies, but probably not one for everybody. Um, so we, we then um, prioritized the stressors, and we, we focused on Slavsky's level two stressors. So he has level ones and level twos. And the good thing about using Slavsky is that this is a, a nomenclature that's being used in many places in the United States and uh, other places in the, in the world even. I've seen IUCN is using this, for, for example, when they come up with their red list. These are the threats that they're, that they're considering when they come up with their lists. Then we identified major ecosystems using uh, Brown's uh, biotic communities. Um, many of us are familiar with that. It doesn't cover the entire LCC, but um, it does a quite, a, quite a good job. So um, this will all come together in a second. And then for the highest priority stressors, we identified the substressors. So for not all of them, but just for the ones we prioritized, we identified substressors. And we developed a questionnaire to rate each of these substressors, high, medium, and low. And you may have uh, seen that questionnaire. How many have taken that questionnaire? Okay, 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 okay. All right, and then we developed a set of criteria that you'll see uh, when Esther comes up to guide our selection of the species or ecological processes to determine, you know, to use as the indicators. We d and now we're getting ready to develop the list of candidate monitoring indicators, and we'll apply these these criteria to that list and we'll develop our, our recommendations for monitoring. 
Okay, so where are we in this process? I kind of already did that. We're to the point where we are starting to develop a list of candidate uh, monitoring indicators. So we've completed all of those steps down to here. These were the level one stressors that they w came out of uh, both a workshop in, in Tucson, our questionnaires, and uh, the workshop in Alas Calientes. And the ones with CC after them relate to climate change. We pulled those out. So this is, this is our grand matrix. And um, so you see the, the uh, ecosystems across the top. And actually, we've broken some of these up into more. Uh, and then the uh, uh, stressors, substressors down the side. And uh, Esther is going to take it from here on what we're going to do next. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK in the back? OK, great. Thanks. So um, as Carol said, we've developed this matrix. Um, and I think everybody on our team is sort of you know, in, geared into always thinking in terms of this matrix. Um, but it's provided a really good framework for us. So we have the ecosystems across the top, as Carol mentioned. And then we have, uh, let's see, which is the, the substressors all the way down. This list here goes down. It's, there's about 73 substressors. So what we are going to try to do is identify the most uh, meaningful monitoring indicators for each of these substressors within these ecosystem types. But as you can imagine, that's a huge number to deal with. So we tried to uh, find a way to prioritize them. Ideally, we'd like to populate this whole matrix um, with high, medium, low knowing that it's going to take a long time to even get through the most important ones. And so that's the questionnaire that Carol mentioned that you might have received. And thank you to all of, all of you who filled out that questionnaire to help us with that. Um, because the intent of the questionnaire was simply to rate um, these, these substressors here in terms of their relevance or their importance. It's not that that's, others are not important, but given our you know, limited resources and time, which ones are we going to address first? So this is just an example. Um, using the, the questionnaire results, we were able to look at um, how many of the respondents rated a particular stressor as high, medium, or low within a certain ecosystem type. So these numbers, these are just shown for example. In fact, these are from a preliminary uh, our first run of the, the questionnaire. And so we would look at you know, how many people rated the spread of invasives as important in riparian habitat versus in grassland. And again, these are just example numbers. Then we uh, have been compiling them. Um, this is just a quick look at uh, how we compiled the numbers, um, the percentage of people who rated something as high. We have different categories, you know, 75% rated high, 90% responded high or medium. And again, this is just an example to uh, show you that we're trying to put a lot of effort even into just uh, prioritizing them. Um, so we are done with that. We, um, we don't have it here to show, but we have a, a, a list of what's come up as high in each of the ecosystems. And um, we just discussed that this morning. We can, uh, as part of this workshop, if it's helpful later, pull up the ones, at least from our questionnaire, that, that came up high for this particular uh, pilot area. So our next step, maybe I us just go back for a second. Once we have these listed as high, we're going to tackle the high ones first. What we want to do is identify um, monitoring indicators, let's say, for this particular cell. So this would be invasive plants within a semi-desert grassland. How are we going to go about that? We certainly can list many, many things that we think we'd like to monitor. But before we start looking at those and start thinking about you know, our own little pet things that we'd like to monitor, we just developed a, a set of criteria by which we would pick these. So what we're currently in the process of doing is developing a long list. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. And then our next step would be to run this long list through a set of criteria, uh, criteria that we have already developed. And I just want to spend a couple moments on this uh, slide. Um, 
so with the team's input and also uh, some uh, input from others in the science working group at, at previous workshops, we came upon these criteria. So for instance, uh, we really want to have a indicator that is going to be providing a meaning, uh, uh, indicator of a meaningful, that's meaningful in the, in, in the ecosystem of interest. Um, we also want it to be sensitive to that particular stressor. And we want it to be sensitive to en enough to detect change, but not so sensitive that it's influenced by 20 other things and is showing all sorts of uh, additional uh, um, changes. We would like something that's, uh, that we can detect at a, an appropriate temporal and spatial scale, something that would be meaningful you know, within our lifetime. Um, and we also want something that's uh, well understood and actually has a known response to the stressor um, of interest, or at least partially well understood. Um, we also want something that's going to be anticipatory and can signify impending change uh, perhaps like the canary in the coal mine. Um, and we want something that's going to be relatively straightforward and cost effective to measure, and something that has broad geographic representation. And as you remember from looking at the map of the desert LCC, it's a huge area. We're not going to be able to measure perhaps the exact same thing all the way across, but if it has relevance, and so we're not measuring apples over here and oranges over here, so these would be criteria by which um, the candidate list would be evaluated by. And then you'll see that there's a second tier, and that's uh, whether or not something is already being measured as an existing monitoring protocol. But again, we had that originally, this particular uh, criteria we had in the upper list. And some people had suggested putting it all the way at the top. But we, we decided to put it at second tier because we really didn't want that to determine what we did. But it is something that we strongly want to consider. And then also something that can be easily understood by, by policymakers and conservation practitioners so that it can be understood by, by a, a broad range of, of folks. So where we are right now, we are um, developing this long list. Um, and again, we're just starting with the high rated cells um, we would like to work our way all the way through, you know, get to the medium ones first, but we, we have to prioritize somewhere. So thanks to, to your help, we're able to at least know which ones are believed to be the highest important ones. Um, and Carol and I and the team are right now working on a process by which we'd like to solicit help from a broader range of, of people, starting with the other uh, science working group teams, the entire science working group, We'll be reaching out to you as well. If you have a particular interest in helping us with this, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so once we develop a long list, um, and we know, I should say it's important at this point too to, to mention that we're, we are trying to be aware of all the other uh, folks who are working on monitoring uh, strategies. We know that the, the, the BLM has the REA process. Um, there is the, the National Park Service has their vital signs monitoring uh, reports, and those efforts have got a lot of really valuable information in them that we're hoping we could use and that, that could perhaps help us populate that long list so that we can, you know, use, not reinvent the wheel, but, but work off of what others have already done. We'll drop them through this uh, list of criteria and identify sort of a shorter suite, a sort shorter list of, of monitoring indicators. And then uh, one of our next steps that we still have to get to then is uh, developing monitoring protocols. We'll be looking at what other people have done for those um, and then initiate some pilot trials. So Carol, is there anything that I forgot to mention that you want to add? Okay, so any questions, we're happy to help and we're planning to stay you know, through the whole workshop. Thanks. If anybody's interested in helping us at any stage of what's left for us to do, yeah, please come up to um, uh, Esther and I during this, and we'll, we'll get your email address and, and get you uh, signed up, because we do need help. Thanks. Thanks. Any questions for Carol or Esther? Okay, thank you. 
clap now. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, before we we just we will uh, let you go on a break um, before we do our last uh, short presentation and then the breakout group. But before we go on break, if you for we need to know approximately how many people are interested in, in each of three topics for our afternoon work. Um, so between biodiversity as a big overarching goal, biodiversity, connectivity, and social ecological services. If you can each in your minds pick one that you're interested in, you might, you're gonna have the opportunity to work on more than one, but we need you to commit to one for the first, um, for one of the groups. So if then, now I'd like to have you raise your hands only one time. But, and everybody should raise their hands once. <laughs> Biodiversity. Okay, Louise, can you be a, hel a counting help? Okay, the three options, put your hands down. Three options. <laughs> Biodiversity, connectivity, and social ecological services. It's like ecosystem services, but with the social in there too. <laughs> Okay, so pick one of those three. Now, again, we're gonna vote. Biodiversity, hands up. Oh, look at the, they're double counting. Hold them high. Don't put them down until they say. Okay, connectivity. Hmm. Social ecological services. Wow, you divvied yourselves up like really evenly without <laughs> without knowing it. Okay. All right, so let's take a short break. We have coffee and snacks over in that corner or side and there's restrooms kind of around both sides of the of the the lower level we're coming back in 15 minutes Okay, we're gonna get started. Okay, thank you for getting quiet so quickly. Um, we will let you know, we thought having two coffee pots was gonna make us constantly have coffee ready, but apparently, <laughs> anyway, the, it'll be ready in like 10 minutes. We will give you the thumbs up. We'll let you know, and then you can go fill your cups. Um, Louise would like to make a few comments first. So I just wanted to provide a little more context for the presentation that uh, Esther and Carol gave us around the pressures and stressors. We're going to be really directly using the work they did on spring streams and grasslands. Later today, we're going to do a really fun card game. So stick around for the afternoon. But um, we're working with... The, the top pressures and stressors that they've already identified through that very rigorous process for those three resources this afternoon. And then the other thing I wanted to say for context is that they're really working, thinking about these issues across the entire desert LCC. So it's this really good context for the whole LCC. And then we're trying to think about these things here today and as we move forward 
for this region. So their, their process is going to continue at this big, big, you know, desert LCC wide scale to, and can inform what we're doing here locally. Okay, and then Laura Norman from USGS has a comment. Um, I just wanted to share, um, uh, I would respond to the call for science for this region and the USGS is, is located next door to this building. There's about 300 scientists working on different aspects of the Madrean right now. And so, you know, we are interested to collaborate and provide some of the science that we're already doing and hope that we can integrate uh, better in the future with this group. And I also brought like 20 or so, 20, 30 copies of this beautiful Borderlands book that talks all about different aspects of science in this region. So please help yourself. They're beautiful color coffee table books with maps. And they're on the back table in two big boxes. First come, grab them. Great. Thank you, Laura. And if any of the rest of you want to offer up some amazing resources. That would be great. Okay, the first, the first big chunk of work we're going to do is shared vision and goals. And to get us started, Genevieve is going to share a few examples uh, from other uh, conservation design processes. Well, I'll, I'll wait for the <laughs> mass <laughs> grabbing of the, <laughs> of the science, which is awesome. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. Um, so we'll wait for that to happen. Also, um, I've actually had the pleasure of listening to Laura give a presentation on a lot of the work that she's done. And um, I, one of the few people that I've heard give presentations on really complex modeling issues um, in a very pragmatic <laughs> um, and interesting way. So um, if you guys are interested, I, I would highly suggest talking to Laura a little bit more about that. Um, great to have her come to meetings and things like that and, and give those presentations. Um, so one of the things that we've been asked a lot as we started this process in landscape conservation planning and design is, um, well, lots of other people have been doing these kind of things. What does it really look like at the end? This is a big, huge process. It's very complex. And we kind of want to know what the products are and how it's really, really actually going to be useful um, in, at the end of this. So um, I, what I've done today is just put together some examples from other efforts. These are just str strictly related to the LCCs, not other efforts like the joint ventures who have been doing this for a long time, mostly because this is what I'm familiar with and I can do it pretty quickly. And um, if you have questions about other efforts um, related especially to things that Larry brought up this morning or to the joint ventures specifically, both Amy and Jenny and Carol are here from the Rio Grande and the Snorin Joint Venture, and they can give you some more details about things like that. So, <laughs> apparently I, I don't know where to point the thing. Again, just wanted to, to set context for these basic elements of landscape conservation, planning and design. Um, mostly what we'll be talking about today are these big priorities, these big goals, and so I'll give you some examples of how other um, LCCs have addressed these. And the Great Northern LCC, the Crown of the Continent, um, the Managers Partnership Group has looked specifically at developing baseline assessments, and their goal for this area is managing together for ecological integrity at a large landscape scale. So again, big goals, big issues. Um, they've identified a lot of current conditions, so they're trying to track baseline and trend over time to provide information um, about ecological health. This effort's been going on for quite a while. We've talked about indicators of these systems. One of their indicators is grizzly pear. So they've done a lot of spatial analysis about occupancy um, and, and where, these, where this, these connectivity issues should be conserved for the future. The Lucian and Bering Sea Islands LCC um, had a different goal to evaluate risks to key wildlife that's really associated with marine vessel traffic, invasive and injurious species, contaminants, and climate change. So these four things here are their stressors. They're the stressors that their partnership prioritized, just like our partnership is pri prioritizing stressors for, for the desert LCC. And these were some of the things that they valued. Um, along with making sure that the economic opportunities for fishing and marine traffic continued in the region, so socio-ecological indicators. Um, 
What their work did was basically informed five areas to be avoided. This was adopted, and these are now on maps um, in this particular area, so that marine traffic is moved outside of these particular areas. The models show that this is going to potentially reduce risk to seabird colonies by 17% and endangered stellar sea lion rookeries and haulouts by 21%. So indicators for the things that they're looking at, the analysis that they did in response to the stressors that they selected, and what they think the outcomes are going to be. And then again, they've developed a map that's actually been adopted. It also meets the value of making sure that this is not an economic impact to the region by adding less than 1% to the overall distance of the voyage. The Appalachian LCC's conservation design project is prioritizing places and actions that hold greatest promise for protection of biodiversity. So some folks are looking more at this idea of ecological um, connectivity, others biodiversity, others very specific um, resources in response to threats, but these are all really related topics. Um, what they're, again, is they've identified ecologically significant habitat and resources that are connected in their region. And these are examples where they've selected indicators, or they call them conservation targets, so species that are representative of these significant habitats. And they are using those to assess major landscape level stressors. Their stressors, climate change, energy development, and urbanization from housing density. Again, using this information to inform where priority action should occur on the landscape. South Atlantic LCC Conservation Blueprint. Their, prior, their goal was to prioritize most important areas for natural and cult cultural resources, areas for conservation, where people could take action um, to conserve these resources. And they focused on really identifying corridors that link the coastal and inland areas, span climate gradients, so this idea of refugia, so that species have the opportunity to move in the face of change over time and selected very scientifically, very rigorously, um, indicators of those systems. California LCC focused a lot on, again, biodiversity in looking to protect two million acres in the Bay Area's upland habitats. Now, their sort of priorities included things like vegetation rarity. They focused on ecosystems that um, like the bayland habitats, the subtidal habitats, and the upland habitats, similar to what we'll be doing today about identifying additional resources in the Madrean um, that are of critical importance to this area. But they also looked at rare and endemic species um, and then included converted lands and protected areas in their analysis to identify critical linkages. Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers LCC is actually doing some work with cities on a smaller scale. As Larry mentioned earlier, this idea of spatial scale is fluid. It can be very large to very small. And they're focused on a specific species, monarch. Um, this was, the goal is to conserve monarch butterfly, and especially in these urban landscapes. So this is really an idea of where the human dimension comes in in this particular project. The mayor of St. Louis um, is very involved in this project. The city is very involved in this project. And the reason was because they thought that it would help connect urban citizens to their landscapes. And they had reasons for it. They had very specific reasons. Improved health, improved well-being, reduced stress, anxiety, enhanced educational outcomes. And they used science that proved that when children, especially in urban landscapes, are connected to nature, have these opportunities that they learn better, that people's um, individual stress levels are reduced, that people have increased health and well-being. So they actually used science to come up with these reasons for being involved in this LCD project. Um, the Mississippi River Basin, so this is an example of an extra, 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 extra large <laughs> landscape. <laughs> Um, his seven LCCs, along with all of their partners, developing a framework um, for objectives that represent wildlife water quality, so ecosystem services, and agricultural productivity, again, um, looking at multi-sectoral interests, including those things like food production um, and economic development. They focused on water quality zones, which is this blue area here. Um, 
instead of the full basin because it was smaller. <laughs> and uh, they are, again, they, with their partners, selected objectives related to agricultural production, gra grazing lands, and floodplain forests. And they wanted to make sure that they could meet objectives for conserving wildlife, conserving biodiversity, providing for increased water quality while also meeting agricultural productions, keeping grazing lands, working lands intact, and then um, making sure that they could provide floodplain protection for urban development and rural development um, as well, and focus on ecosystem services. The outcome is that they're actually working with those partners to determine where key, um, what are these key ecological areas for protection and what can people do in there. And they are currently working on agreements with those partners to do that. Um, the Columbia Plateau uh, strategy design, this is just an example of, because we, we do all these things like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna produce these great maps, we're gonna produce this list of actions, and then what? Um, who actually takes the information and implements it, and how do you make sure that it's being used productively to achieve those common goals? So in this particular example, they have started to use and work with those partners through the Sage Grouse Initiative, uh, BLM's resource, ma resource management plans, the Healthy, Healthy Lands Initiative focal areas, priority landscapes, land acquisitions, um, and partners for fish and wildlife program, and come up with specific agreements um, that implement this design. So the outcome is, once you come up with all this information and, and we, agree on, we agree upon a suite of actions, who can do what within the context of their management space? And each of these partners can do a very specific thing that this collective already developed. And so that's the end goal of where we're going.